this is our panel, uh, which we will introduce momentarily as we discuss uh, the questions at hand. Uh, so let's talk about uh, CTDNA or circuit tumor DNA, which is, uh, as we all know, a hot topic. Um, circuit tumor DNA uh, applies to the, the DNA from the tumor that is shed into the plasma, into the free DNA, not in the cells. That plasma-free DNA is a potpourri of DNA from various sources, fetal DNA, viral DNA, white cell DNA, germline DNA, and in some instances, tumor DNA. And increasingly, we have found that this minimally invasive and convenient biospecimen can assist in patient care. And thinking about the clinical applications of this quote-unquote liquid biopsy technology, uh, I, I like to categorize it in three broad groups. The first is molecular characterization. At the time of diagnosis or at resistance, figuring out what a cancer is thinking, figuring out its genotype. That is the state of the art today. The FDA has approved one uh, EGFR assay for liquid biopsy, lung cancer genotyping. There is now CMS uh, approval to reimburse use of additional other assays in cancer care. I today routinely, when I see my lung cancer patients, send off a liquid biopsy to find their genotype and help guide care. Number one, for today's purposes, is old news, okay? Though one can argue there's still some validation needed to be done to make these as rigorous as possible. We're gonna move past that to number two. Number two is cancer detection. This is quote unquote the holy grail. Can we search for cancer before diagnosis? Can we find leftover cancer in a patient apparently cured, minimal residual disease? Cancer detection assays are also broadly in development from many different groups. They have a slightly different approach, finding a cancer signal from noise. Uh, that is not the topic of today. Today we are looking really for, can for topic number three, which is monitoring the tumor DNA in the blood and evaluating over time how a drug is or is not working in a given patient and the opportunity of cancer monitoring in supporting drug development. Uh, and, and so with that motivation, we assembled this working group to one, assess the state of CTDNA as a monitoring, a monitoring tool today, to suggest some best practices that we all could use for integrating CTDNA evaluation in our ongoing trials, and to propose some opportunities for operationalizing how we can turn CTDNA monitoring from a thing that we're all doing into a collaborative way of learning on how to do this best for drug development going forward. Uh, and that involves prospective data collection, a pilot, should we all work together to pilot data collection, or retrospective data collection, can we put the data that's out there in a place to learn from? We'll talk about those more. I'm going to first highlight two, pu two published literature, two published papers. Uh, on the left is a, is a trial I was involved in with an Estella CGFR inhibitor, and in this phase one dose escalation study, uh, I, you know, after the trial was completed, suggested, hey, let's look at what happened to the plasma DNA in these patients during dose escalation. This is the levels of EGFR T790M. This is a drug intended to hit EGFR T790M. And what you see is, as the drug escalates, it's a waterfall plot of their EGFR T790M levels, they go down dramatically. What a handy way of getting a feel for whether a drug is active or not active at a given dose. Is this meaningful? I mean, it certainly looks profound. There's one that goes up, that's a patient with a germline EGFR T790M. All the others go down. Seems like an active drug. I will note that that drug in randomized phase three trial compared to erlotinib was negative. It was worse than standard of care. So I don't know how good this plasma waterfall plot is. Look, it's an active drug, and we can learn that from this biomarker. Uh, and that's one way that I'm now you know, using this kind of assay in drug development and trials I'm currently involved in. On the right hand side is uh, work from AstraZeneca recently, Medivine recently, uh, looking at changes in plasma tumor levels, tumor DNA levels, and using a next gen sequencing assay where they calculated, this is an immunotherapy trial, patients treated with their biomet, uh, patients who had a reduction in levels of their tumor DNA versus an increase in their levels of the tumor DNA. And what you can see is, having your tumor DNA levels go down, that's the black line, you do better. And having your tumor DNA levels go up, that's the red line, you do worse. And this prognostication was, was possible at just six weeks of therapy. So every six weeks, you can get a feel of how a drug is working in an individual patient. Now, you know, these are two ways that these tools are being used today in ongoing trials and trial analysis across many different uh, pharma sponsors and, and uh, NCI trials as well I'm involved in. Um, I will say, though, looking at the details of these two cases plus a third uh, prior study um, from Genentech, Roche, uh, what we see is that there's actually incredible variability 
and how these different published reports are using these tools. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the FASTAC study used a COBOS semi-quantitative assay. The two on the right used quantitative assays, uh, beaming PCR versus NGS. Uh, the right-hand assay used a multi-analyte uh, NGS assay across multiple variants. The left two used just EGFR. They looked at different time points. The middle one did two weeks, the others did six weeks. Uh, they looked at different ways of quantifying up and down. And that, so the consistency is that it seems interesting everyone's doing it. But the inconsistency is that everyone's doing it a little bit differently in terms of how you quantify tuberculin, the timing you use, the endpoints you correlate it with. And so that seems like it's compelling, but we could work perhaps to get all on the same page so we had some best practices. And so one thing that I would talk about is how could we advocate for sponsors that are out there looking to integrate plasma collection in their trials, ways of doing it. And these are the basic principles we've put into a table that we're hoping sponsors will take a look at. Uh, the, the point is collection of plasma is relatively easy, and we'll hear shortly from our patient advocate about how easy it really is for the patient, mind you. But from a trial standpoint, collecting blood can be done, and, and we know how to collect it, what tubes to use, we know which time points, it seems like early time points can get a lot of data, and so collecting after a couple weeks makes sense. Uh, it probably makes sense to collect a second tube. So you have a second tube for bridging studies and other technologies, so you can use your first tube for your initial tests. Different platforms can be used, but a quantitative platform makes sense. Most platforms can calculate an allelic fraction, which means the percent of DNA that's a mutant versus wild type. AF is one standard tool that can be used across platforms. And we're still figuring out how to analyze all this. And so we think that trials should be doing this, and there is a fairly established way that we can all be doing this in our trials today and collect plasma for future learning. Um, but beyond that, beyond the idea that we all should be collecting this plasma on clinical trials, how can we actually learn? And that's what I want to talk about today with our panel, which is what can we do to work together to pool our learnings, either from existing data retrospectively or together to prospectively collect data to address a key question so we can get to the same page and, and, and learn broadly about how to integrate this to drug development going forward. Um, there are some tables up here about the kinds of details we're envisioning. There's some fine print here. It's all in your booklets, which you can take a look at, please. Um, and I will zip through these and, and get to uh, the next steps. But let me just put this on the, on the, on the radar, and I'm going to next turn to our panel. Dan, am I doing this right? Okay, great. Um, and uh, ask some questions that we can uh, have a conversation, and then we'll open up for broad discussion. Uh, my first question is to our pharma colleagues, uh, David and John Charles. So, you know, from the perspective of pharma, tell us the potential here. Tell us what you see in this biospecimen for drug development, uh, and, and uh, how big is the opportunity? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I believe it's uh, very significant, and it's very clear that the acceleration of uh, technology and the sensitivity and the multiplicity of the techniques is allowing uh, for this tool to have multiple potential functions, not only from genotyping patients at uh, entry on clinical trials, and I think in that setting, uh, AstraZeneca has done on their own plan, by the way, and Carl Barrett, who are here, great job in selecting patients. And FDA was very supportive of having liquid biopsies as a way to select for EGFR mutation or TCN and That's right, one. that's happening today. Trials that's today, blood patients on based on the blood test. Then obviously we have other possibilities, which are, uh, for instance, uh, because of the specific nature of these mutations you can follow in the block. Right? This is very different from the classical tumor markers that we know have no specificity to the inflammation, infection, any other things. These are real mutations from the tumor. You can follow uh, the allelic fraction and its change longitudinally and try to make it a surrogate of objective response rate or PFS. I think, uh, you share one of the publications from uh, our group at Medimun uh, using uh, Durvalima. I think that has a huge potential, especially for immunotherapies where, you know, response rate is not always a good predictor of what's going to happen uh, down the line in terms of survival. And uh, obviously, um, high-risk adjuvant patients, correct? I mean, this is a tool that can completely transform the way uh, pharma, but also other stakeholders, look at adjuvant therapies. Adjuvant therapies are usually lengthy, you need um, thousands of patients. Uh, High-risk patients identified with positive CTDNA could really represent a huge new opportunity 
uh, to test uh, uh, therapeutic intervention and have an answer in a much more quicker time. Yeah, I, I think I agree with John Paul. I think it, it, for, for, for us, from a developer perspective, um, it's, it's about speed. And I, you know, if you have a number of candidate drugs, uh, differentiating between them, particularly if they're against the same target, can be quite difficult. You know, you don't want to have to wait for PFS or OS. So, you know, these early signals of response can really be helpful in terms of decision making. Um, but, you know, I think the key is, is as we're pointing out, is, is to get to uh, validated assays to actually do that. If, if um, the allele frequencies just drop across the board, you're not really differentiating. So, you know, you need to look at multiple mutations. You know, how, how do you do it in a, in a, in a reliable way? Um, so, yeah, I think, I think you know, also correlating with, with uh, imaging, um, you know, how, how to do that, I think that, that would uh, also accelerate things like that. I'm remiss if you each should introduce yourself before you speak. So, can you, Dr. Sorry and Dr. James, tell us who you are and where you're from. Jean-Charles uh, Sorry, I'm a medical oncologist currently in Paris, moved from academia, where I was a professor in Paris, to industry a year ago. So, pretty new in this uh, so I'm, I'm David Shames, uh, I'm a scientist at Genentech, and I've been, I've been there 10 years working on lung cancer biomarkers, both in signaling and also uh, cancer immune therapy projects. Okay, so my next question is from the diagnostics perspective. Daria, you're interested in, introduce yourself, and here's the question I want you to think about. Uh, if we're turning these tools from detection or genotyping assays, yes, no result, into quantitative assays that assess over time change in a given patient, how does that change the laboratory perspective of how you develop these and validate these assays? And are they today valid for this purpose or what else need to be done? Thank you. Uh, Daria Trudeau, I lead technology development at Garden. Um, and we've enjoyed kind of the phases that Jeff walked through, starting with generic genotyping applications, where the only thing that matters is does the patient have the marker, yes or no. We're talking about line two and three here, where quantitative perspectives on the assays are becoming much more important. And understanding the precision and margin of error in making the right conclusions from this data is imperative. It's not something a physician can look at the report and know what's going on until they go in the field and doing it professionally uh, for some time, right? So we need to develop these tools where the inference is taken out of the um, interpretation and put into the primary development where these endpoints are defined and validated in a perfected manner within a trial. What we are finding extremely helpful is um, ability to learn on a multi-year horizon from 100,000 patient samples, what, what it makes to accurately estimate a loop fraction or what it makes uh, to accurately capture the fragments that have mutants in them and get to these uh, numbers, not from sort of somebody randomly drawing things on paper, but really working from huge data sets and big data kind of as a um, term that everybody is using to describe a lot of things that are going on in the industry and it's been not afforded to genomics community for a long time in terms of patients, uh, right? We have very rich data sets that go horizontally but not very rich that go um, across different patients. So that's what's enabling this at a quantitative level in the next few years. I think we'll get there to be able to, to make those assessments quantitatively. Uh, we have with us two representatives from the FDA. The question I want to ask to each of you is, uh, you know, what do you see as the hurdles if sponsors now want to make these kinds of biomarkers part of regulatory submissions? Uh, what's the short game and what's the long game? Uh, and what needs to happen for us to turn these into reality and, and be part of a package that comes to you guys? And, and for you not to laugh at them and say, wow, you know, that's great data helping this label or this package. I apologize. So they told me they could help me out with the microphone, so talk it up. <laughs> um, my name is Julia Beaver. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm director of Division of Oncology Products 1 at FDA. And um, I'm really excited and passionate about CTDNA, which is why I'm here, despite my voice. Um, I think there are definitely some hurdles. I do not think that we are there yet. We are from a monitoring standpoint we'd be able to um, use the change in CTDNA as the primary efficacy measure. Um, but I do think that uh, FDA is really um, looking forward to and interested in collaborating with stakeholders to help gather the evidence necessary to demonstrate that type of approach. And um, what that would take is, I think, 
within each context of use, um, meaning respect of type of drug and disease setting, being able to demonstrate that the change in, in ctDNA really does predict outcome. And it goes along with a lot of the parameters that we outlined in the white paper as being supportive of that. And similar to what Jeff mentioned, you know, we need to know at what time point you would be collecting the ctDNA, what is the amount of change that is a response, um, and what are some of the analytical variables that would be required. I am Rina Fuller from Center for Devices, Office of In Vitro Diagnostics. Um, so, you know, I want to echo um, the points what Julia mentioned in terms of the collection of samples before I get to the, the test. So, we yeah, the the timing of collection, you know, how CDD is collected and also how the clinical endpoint is defined, whether the collection points cover the, the endpoint. Uh, all of that is pretty critical for us to actually look at and see whether it actually uh, you know, covers the, for the monitoring aspect and how the endpoints are defined. Um, so those are some of the critical <coughs> aspects we look into for the monitoring assays. Uh, but at the same time, the analytical validation for the monitoring assays, it's very really important. Um, like what Jeff was saying earlier, we have experiences mostly on the qualitative assays. So, the, uh, so we, we have approved the only one so far, that's the, the COBAS um, PGFR assay, but that's the PCR-based assay. And uh, we do have a lot of interest, you know, there are a lot of submissions right now, probably, you probably know from the breakthrough designation, uh, you know, genome web news that goes out, we do have a lot of breakthrough designation requests granted for ctDNA assays. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in the NGS space as well, and, um, and also digital PCR. So, um, so for the qualitative assays, there are some of the analytical validation studies that, you know, definitely, uh, I think that's really clearly known. And the quantitative assay, there may be some additional uh, analytical validation studies that, um, one has to perform to make sure they are analytically validated. And uh, that includes like limited quantitation and linearity in addition to the other um, studies. And, um, and at the same time, you know, make sure that the assay should be uh, pre-specified to cut off, you know, this, you know, the same mantra that we keep saying, but I mean, we still see people not um, locking the assays, not analytically validating before using them in the clinical trial, but uh, those are analytically validating, having a pre-specified data that is so important so they can at least understand whether the assay actually, you know, uh, data, if you want to understand the data, what it means, you need to have a good assay up front. Um, a lot of good questions come up with that. I'm going to introduce our last, our, ask Jamie to introduce yourself, the last, our last member of the panel here, with the question of what we're describing here is patients everywhere in clinical trials undergoing incessant, never-ending phlebotomy to contribute to the greater good of science, which is sort of how trial participation is today, right? The pharmacogenomic sample for your germline DNA, a CTC sample, a cell for DNA sample, a PK sample. Um, you know, what is the experience of the patient going through this, and are they on board for this? And are they on board for that data not only going towards their trial participation, or their trials analysis, but broadly towards learning about drugs and trials in general in a collaborative way. So thank you. I'm Jamie Holliday. I'm a patient advocate I'm with Georgetown Breast Cancer Advocates, and um, and I think I think what you said second was perfect. That patients are already going through a series of blood draws with any um, clinical trial, and so really one tube, even for patients who it's hard to do a blood draw because it has to be accessed to report or because they have problems with their veins. If you've already started a blood draw, one extra tube is not um, a huge burden, I don't think, on most patients. Um, and if you contrast that with another option to look at how tumor is changing, that would be a biopsy. And I can think of almost no situation where a blood draw is worse than a biopsy. Um, and so that's a really important thing for patients to consider. Um, <laughs> most cancer patients are pretty happy for their experience to contribute to some sort of greater good because it's a terrible experience. And if you can ever, if you're going through something hard no matter what it is, if you can make it better for somebody else, that's a sort of normal um, desire. And so wanting to use your data to help someone else is a pretty natural tendency, I think, for a lot of cancer patients. The one thing that I think is really important as um, scientists and clinicians is to communicate well so that patients understand 
why the extra blood draw is necessary, how it's going to be useful, um, because if you just say, we just need one, there are probably going to be people who are going to say, well, no, I need my blood, right? But, um, but when you communicate to a patient that this is really going to help the way we understand diagnostic tools in a way that can be meaningful in so many different um, ways that we just discussed briefly, I think that's something that, um, that most patients would be very um, excited to participate in. So the questions that we'll then start discussing are how do we embark upon this? Uh, to learn something from what's out there. And I guess the two, the two sort of approaches that are up there on, on the screen for us to talk about are, first, you know, there exists today plasma that's been collected, analyses that have been done, distributed across pharma sponsored, sponsors. Is there quality data to be learned from in all of that? Or is it too messy from sponsor to sponsor and assay to assay that, that we can't learn from it? Uh, should we give up on the existing data and is the way to, to tackle this to all work together prospectively to you know, perform some rigorous collection paradigm analysis approach that we learn broadly from? Um, and what are the strengths and weaknesses of those two alternatives? Um, and I'll guess, Rina, because you spoke to the variability of assays. Um, and the challenge of assays that had already been studied in an ad hoc way but not pre-specified. Um, do we throw up our hands at those results, or are there things to be learned from the analysis that have been done already, uh, even when the performance of the assay might have been post hoc in a somewhat not totally thought through spontaneous way? Yeah, so but I, I guess I just want to also talk about Black Pack in this aspect. Um, so, Black Pack uh, is a non profit consortium. It um, originated um, from the Moonshot. Vice President Biden's initiative. And um, there is, I guess, academia. I see John Simmons is part of that and Harvard. So a lot of people in the audience, I guess, are part of, you know, some of these part of this blood track consortium. So academia, industry, you know, both diagnostic, pharma, you know, uh, FDA. So a lot of people are part of it. Um, if the goal is to identify the first phrase one was to identify the common data and of elements for the pre-analytical variables. Um, so there is a list of common data elements that uh, I think the consortium worked out, which could be helpful in this if we are going for a perspective. You know, what are the details, the different elements to be collected in a clinical trial? And that was the first phase. And the second one is uh, working on the analytical part of the, and uh, you know, Jen Vicky, a lot of people have put together protocols that I think have been discussed, you know, right now it's been under discussion, but it's a, it's a general protocol um, on the, it's specifically in it, that sense, we say about qualitative, quantitative, but it's, I guess, it's addressing everything, um, and what are the different studies that CTDNA, anyone who's planning to use CTDNA should be um, undergoing, you know, as the basis for analytical validation. So I think that's, um, a, it's a very good platform where people can learn what are the, you know, the pre-analytical and the analytical aspects, what needs to be done um, going forward to go the prospect of data collection. I think this is one of the uh, things what we learned is that I think a lot of people have already done um, blood collection tube experiment, which blood collection tube is better, so that's, um, and I guess there is a, a paper that may be coming out of that which says, you know, multiple pharma companies have done that experiment to see which blood collection to use is better. Um, so you could learn from that data just um, going forward and use that information in the future clinical trials. So are things we know now, we, you know, we, we, I mean, I guess it, it was a conclusive, like, do we know the best practices? You're, you guys are involved in blood pack, right? Like, <laughs> are there still variables out there? Sometimes I worry about the extra variables. It's like, what if it's daytime or nighttime? How does the assay change, right? Some of these things don't, really matter that much. You know, if the patient's actively infected or not, that's an interesting question, I guess. Um, is it settled enough that we could do this without knowing all these details ironed out, or are there like key missing elements in pre-analytical and analytical handling that, that are still unanswered? So I think it, to some degree it extent, depends on the degree of the lens you're using to look at the problem, right? Uh, so if you're looking at it from a point of view of uh, you know, performance of, of the test across large patient cohorts with uh, reasonable analytical and clinical validation data available for the test that kind of incorporates these variables. 
as unobserved variables that we kind of briefly talked about in the morning. You don't know what they are, but you know average effect of them across the population of which you've tested, so you kind of cap the potential impact by the performance data you've generated across a reasonable population of patients. And so we, have, we don't have these answers at the levels of individual variables here, but we clearly have these answers at the level of average across the relevant patient population, right? Whether that's sufficient enough uh, for the use of the test or you're going to take, take the lens and study a particular question, you know, that's, the answer is different. But from a clinical impact on the patient, we know performance characteristics that are relevant that incorporate these factors. Uh, Blood pack has spent quite a bit of effort, and I really uh, like how systematically they went through the list of, I don't remember, 53 plus variables that were on that list to condense it to something that's much more meaningful uh, that would be used to characterize some of the specimen collections, procedures, etc. But I think there's a lot of effort also paid on the full on analytical validation studies that are characterizing the assays from both qualitative and quantitative procedures. Arriving at standards in that space would be absolutely uh, beneficial to everybody in the community for us in the diagnostic space for pharma companies on, on kind of as the use case scenarios developed for this and ultimately for, for patients as well. I also uh, think it will clear the path through the approval process because we're debating so many things internally on how do we do this or how do we do that in the context of the, the sort of future FDA approval that could be cut out of the process um, once we make further progress with blood fat and designing some of these common shared study protocols. So I think these efforts ultimately will take us to the next level of standardizing here that would be important. So let's talk about the next level then to some extent, right? So we'll assume that someone's going to figure out the best way to handle blood. And someone's going to figure out the best way to analyze blood. And they're going to tell us some numbers. And then we're going to have to be stuck with the main question that I forgot to ask, which is, what is a response? What is a meaningful change? So anyone who wants to take that one on, I want you to try to reply. Your instinct of how much change is meaningful in a patient who's shedding tumor DNA to say this patient, oh look, I think you've had a response in your plasma versus not. Julia, looks like you have some ideas on that.
Uh, so you think you know what truth is, and then you can look at response rates with the tissue assay versus the blood assay, and are they the same or are they different, right? So with, with this, um, the monitoring case, it, there is no real standard other than potentially overall survival um, that you would have to benchmark to. So I think it's a little complicated. Um, you know, unless it's really obvious, which it, it may be, I think, in some of the data that, that you showed uh, that has been published, particularly in the management setting, suggests that it probably isn't that sensitive, right? It, it just, there's ctDNA there, uh, the patient's going to relapse, or there's, there's tumor growing. Uh, if there isn't, then um, the patient's going to be better. So uh, see, that's, that's not good enough for, for FDA, but um, you know, maybe, maybe it's not as complicated as we thought with respect to you know, how sensitive we have to go. It may be relatively binary. I think, I think oh, sorry, just, could I just clear that? I think that adjuvant setting is very different from the metastatic setting. I think we know in the adjuvant setting from the data we have, ctDNA is a prognostic marker. And so you can really um, identify a high risk population in that setting. Um, but I think in terms of the change you need to see in the metastatic setting, that's somewhat of a different as with therapeutics, we probably need to start learning for advanced disease and learn something before we apply it maybe to early stage, which is, you know, maybe simpler, I guess, to some extent, because it's the bad diagnostic side when you get there. Very you going to say something else? I, I like the way you're asking this question about how to approach the change and how to define the change and being sort of a data-driven person. I think there are two ways to that answer. One is the technical, technological, and it should be up to the diagnostic provider what makes a meaningful change in their technology given the precision of the estimates, etc. And the other one is biological, and that latter one cannot be answered until we get some real data from clinical trial patients and establish performance of that pre-specified product from a biological perspective. But I think we, we have to separate them and make sure diagnostics does their job in terms of defining what's technologically feasible, and um, clinical trial establishes the real clinical benefit on the biology side. We, we shouldn't mix those two up into a single answer. And, and I, was, I would also say that that's one place where the data repository could really be so valuable because we have so much patient data that's not currently really used um, in a meaningful way that's kind of being wasted. And, um, and it's not going to necessarily be as clean, but it can certainly point us into some directions of the kinds of changes that are actually meaningful on a long term. If we start something now, and especially in lower risk populations, you're not going to see the outcome that you're maybe looking for for a long time. But if we can look at some of the older data and get some clues about where we should be looking going forward, I think it could be really meaningful. And Rena, I like your point about how different it is with EGFR. You focus on a driver, and the changes you're seeing are probably related to the tumor, as you said, Dr. Charles. But if you're looking at a bunch of mutations in the plasma from next gen sequencing, some of which might be from white cells or not, P53, who knows where it's from. You're, yeah, you're we didn't even bring up that the uh, shield false positive. That or following germline mutations. Yeah. It looks flat, right. funny, because it's germline, right? You shouldn't be following that. Yeah. Um, like, this is really done. I see this in reports. Um, and so some would say, all oh, those old EGFR trials, they're, they're, you know, they're old news. Move on to next gen sequencing. And yet, those old EGFR trials, we can learn a lot from perhaps because they were focused in their analysis and take those learnings and move them to the next gen sequencing platforms, which will be more complicated in their, in their variability, um, but, but also have greater potential because of their clickability in lots of situations. Uh, I, I think about, you know, this, this deals reminiscent of resist, right? Anyone remember where resist comes from, right? And resist and WHO and imaging response criteria, right? So it was a data warehouse that I don't even know how it came up with it. A bunch of radiologists put their scans in there. And they weren't like necessarily the highest quality trials. There were like a bunch of random trials sitting around that were put in this place and they asked questions about what changes or what changes, which goes back to where all that comes from, which is like the 70s and like old, you know, where the origins of these response criteria are pretty sketchy perhaps, one might realize in retrospect. Uh, but again, we have to almost do the same thing, which is how much changes is meaningful uh, from a variability standpoint, how much change is meaningful from a clinical standpoint, uh, and, and put a place much like a resist data warehouse where we could put plasma response data. Gosh, anyone know of a warehouse where we can put this data? I think that's another interesting question on the intersection about this effort with blood path. Um, so blood path is building not only the analytical validation side of um, representing sort of ctDNA space um, in, in genomic and clinical data, but also uh, building significant data repositories uh, 
similar to TCGA and NIH initiatives that are now funded in a different way and provided through some of the common tools between that project and um, the other TCGA efforts. Um, and so to what extent there's a pretty good collaborative platform that could be available for that uh, space, we need to work together to define that. Or the other place is position FDA. So that's yes. Yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> Actually, the more experts are in the room, like um, John and Joanna, they are all from Precision FDA. So it's a cloud-based um, cloud platform that um, where you can, it was originally um, done for NGS, but I understand this one will have PCR and DDPCR and all that, but I believe, I talked to them, I think that there's a way you can put that data in there. And uh, it was developed to, to, to work on the, you know, how people can use different bioinformatics pipelines and come up with the reference standards and, and also work on regulatory science that was the full purpose of that position at FDA that it was originally um, started. Um, but, you know, there are other, I believe now they're working on some proteogenomics data, I think will be, uh, so this will be similar, you know, to CGDNA data. And, uh, but it only, um, some, I guess we'll have to form a consortium to mine that data. I don't think people at FDA have time to um, mine the data in position FDA, so, but that could be a platform. Dr. Soria, from your academic hat, I'm sure you can see the value of such a consortium. Tell us from your pharma hat, uh, you know, is this data precious or too precious to put in such a place? You know, what, what are the limitations or opportunities from a pharma standpoint in terms of contributing data like this? I like your analogy with uh, the ERTC resist. It was, at that time point, uh, not so valuable when people were putting the data, but it turned out to be hugely valuable down the line, correct? Because you have this common denominator to call out whether you have efficacy or no efficacy. So I think we are really on the key question here. I think there is a truly, it's a real willingness from different farm stakeholders, and I could hear from General Tech is in the panel for that reason too, is we want to get CTDNA evaluated by FDA at a speed that is quicker than the way we did MRD in here. Uh, I do not think patients are going to be happy, and we owe it to the patients to do this better and quicker, uh, because the science uh, and the technology have evolved. So the quick question is, where do we host this data, in which warehouse, and what are the rules of engagement? And who has the expertise and the time to fund the analysis, correct? I'm sure we can put it in the FDA repository. But then how many FDA experts you have to look at CTDNA analysis? You have 100 medical oncologists, Dr. Pastor, but how many experts of CTDNA do you have? Is there enough forces there? Uh, how much of academia input we need, correct? And uh, it's clear from a pharma perspective that uh, some of the trials that happen on phase one, phase two could be put there. But if you are asking them to put their phase three trial with already approval with patient-led data, this becomes a very tricky question because people might believe that if there are not clear rules of who can access this, you are giving very precious data without certainties of the uh, you know, safe words of who's going to ask it. But I think that's exactly why this panel should try to address that. I mean, and FDA needs to give us guidance. How do they see this? Because at the end of the day, they're going to make the, uh, they're going to be the ones who are the game changers. Once F if FDA sees enough data on different tumor types, across different mechanisms of actions of different therapies, across different technological panels for CTD analysis, I'm hopeful that Dr. Pasteur might say, well, finally, your excitement is justified. But I don't know. <laughs> what, is, what are the access, how is this database you described accessed? Uh, so the FDA has a bandwidth to tap into it. How, how is it structured for the existing projects such that academia or even pharma can tap into it in order to query it and under what are the existing rules? And I, I'm happy to yes, ask John um, if he's John, the right person to answer. answer that question? Anyone got a microphone for John in the back? <laughs> Raise your hand, John. <laughs> the question is, what are the rules for access of this precision oncology database? Just to elucidate. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, so the uh, access rules are basically... John, you have to introduce yourself first. Oh, sorry, I'm John Dedean. I'm a principal scientist with DNA Nexus and working with the FDA to build a precision FDA platform. Uh, and the, the rules of engagement with precision FDA are, uh, you know, the default is to be open. And so unless you um, take steps to keep your data private, which you are able to do on precision FDA, uh, the, the data will be open and accessible to anyone. And we create different mechanisms for different levels of privacy or openness. So we have like workspace areas where you can make some things pub public, some things private. Uh, so a very flexible model for data sharing. But uh, right, and, but, limitable, but also limitable. So I can envision uh, ways in which a precious data set could be contributed, but only in part, for example, or you know, subdivided so that not all. I, mean, I can find ways. I think there are ways to blind data to make it usable without necessarily exposing all the the secrets um, that, that some of these precious data sets might have within them. Um, you, you know, I, I, one of the potentials I see here is that there is a unit of measure. That might not be the perfect unit of measure, but it's a unit of measure that many of these technologies all use, which is this measure called allelic fraction, which is what percent of, of DNA fragments at this exact spot are mutant versus wild type. And I think we've all come towards this metric um, because it's convenient and works across platforms. Uh, you know, is it the obvious measure that we should all use to measure response? Julie, you've done a lot of this work over the years. Did you, are you a believer in AF? Is it flawed? But of course, could it be the, unif the unifying measure of plasma quantification? Well, let me also depend on what technique you're using. So I think <clears throat> that will come into play as well. But I do think that AF is widely used to determine responses, just what level it is, is it that you're looking for. And um, it's just a little bit going down enough, or is it complete resolution? And if it's complete resolution, it depends on what technique you're using, because complete resi resolution on one technique may be different than on another. So, in terms of the sensitivity of the technique, you may be able to go down to a very low allelic fraction with, you know, drop a digital PCR, which is not quite as low as some of the other NGS techniques. Right. What's measurable disease is another question, right? What level is actually valuable and what level is noise? And I think we all start to worry. Carl can speak at some point. Carl Barrett's here has described that below 1%, a lot of the assays just get very noisy. Uh, and so, or is it 0.5%? At what cut point are you just following noise and you're not actually following a tumor signal um, is a question that, that we, we can't, we, I don't know if we have the answer to necessarily. But isn't that something maybe this, you know, once the consortium can work out? Because I, is it like, is it one person below one person? Is it 0.15%? But I know, you know, diagnostic sponsors may have a different perspective on that. But what is the good point below which it's the noise? Because definitely there is some noise right, in this. And um, especially for monitoring, you need to make sure you know, that you can measure the noise and say there is a change. Okay. Um, um, so I agree. I think that's something that some, we should be working at to see whether we will not pass with the diagnostic sponsors. In the, maybe in the blood pack, that's one thing, or maybe as part of this consortium. <coughs> Um, again, um, like going back to what um, Julie was saying earlier, different uh, diagnostic sponsors, depending on the technology, have different, um, you know, they, they measure different things. Like uh, Roche assay, the one, the one which is approved, was based on poppies per mole. Um, and I believe it's still poppies per mole, uh, not the Roche assay, but that's the PCR based assay. So, you know, so you, once you look at one assay, if it's a monitoring assay, you have to definitely look at the same assay for monitoring because you know the variables are different. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another aspect. Where can you kind of dissect? I don't know. So I, mean, I think one, one of the key related issues uh, also is that um, in many senses, this, this measurement has to be drug independent, right? And, and the argument maybe maybe it isn't going to be right. If it's, if it's a DGFR inhibitor, maybe you look at EGFR, it was one thing, you look at other mutations, it tells you something different. And is that meaningful when you compare it to, you know, if it's going to be an endpoint, it really needs to be consistent across, across drugs. And I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that question. I think we're all a little worried that since immunotherapy is a wild card, it's going to perhaps behave differently. I mean, it's certainly a question that we're all, you know, it would be nice if it suddenly behave like every other therapy in this sense, but it may or may not be. Sarah, you were going to say something. Uh, so I kind of like when things are simple, but unfortunately they're not that simple often. 
Um, and I really like how the white paper here outlines different use cases of cDNA, and we talk specifically differently about molecular response versus monitoring applications versus genotyping applications. All of them place very, very different requirements on how the data that even is generated from a similar platform is being analyzed. And we're, when we are on the diagnostic side developing an application for monitoring, we will uh, treat some of this data differently for reporting and analysis perspective than we would in the context of a genotyping application. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we develop these tools and technologies that are specific for the clinical context in which they're being used. It would be probably not advisable to just think we have a camera that measures cDNA and assume we can use this camera across these different applications. So I just would encourage everybody to be very based in the clinical context in which the, the diagnostic is being used. Um, and um, one more point uh, about tra tracking allelic fraction over time. What we're learning, obviously, as we track uh, patients over time is the landscape of subclonal evolution changes substantially. Um, and so while you can track, you know, driver uh, variant like a GFR that would be shared across all clones, it's not every patient that has that. Um, ability to, to track it through a driver um, identifiable mass levels. And so we need to start parsing out some of the subclonal pictures here to figure out that some of the resistance clones are appearing that were not there before and what does that mean for a clinical um, decision making process. So it will get a little bit more nuanced as, as it starts getting into the clinical realm. Right, and we see that, you know, homogeneous responses better, heterogeneous responses, you can kind of see them in the plasma. And maybe that means yes. less good thing, and parsing that is its own, you know, how do you track multiple alleles or clones at the same time? We're nowhere near ready for that. Really, we're just tracking the overall burden and watching it go down. Tracking the different individual ones is much more complicated. All right, so let's assume that we are all going to get lots of sponsors to contribute lots of existing <laughs> data from old phase one and two trials across various platforms. We'll go in some warehouse, Let's say FDA or blood pack, and we're going to pour over it and we're going to learn some basic answers about what is measurable disease and what is response. These still will be learnings from old, less than perfect data. So how do we also at the same time go about generating a cohort of high quality, very consistent data across trials that would allow us to test in a much more hypothesis driven way uh, a fundamental question about plasma change as a surrogate of efficacy. Um, that's a little more daunting. Uh, are there any examples, I don't know, is there, is there an FDA example of, of this being done with some other biomarker that has achieved or wants to achieve uh, surrogacy? Uh, and what does that look like to, to launch on such an effort? Will be PCR able? Maybe to inform new surrogates, new reason. And those meta-analyses of trials have all been very consistent in their analysis of said surrogate or said biomarker endpoint? Sometimes. <laughs> not, not always. I mean, the example I'm thinking of is PCR. Um, and there were, were slightly different ways. Again, this is a different. PCR is, a, is, a, is very different from cgDNA, but it, it was used a surrogate reasonably like to predict clinical benefit based on meta-analysis, which pooled a lot of studies that have different, um, slightly different pathologic um, complete response. However, the definition was formalized by FDA and then applied. So I think we would need some sort of standard. And it was formalized by the FDA by looking at all the data together across the noisiness of the different variables. So a little bit of variability is tolerated in making this decision. A lot of variability might be more challenging. I do not, but yeah. <laughs> um, so if a bunch of trials launched and collected plasma with the vision of someday being, being an opportunity for a unified analysis of plasma response as a surrogate, even a little bit of variability across those trials might be tolerated towards achieving an analysis. What I'm trying to get that is, yeah, I think if multiple parties decided to launch together an effort to collect plasma in a rigorous way, in a fairly consistent way, uh, that could lead to answers down the line. Um, when planning a trial, <clears throat> sorry. I think, oh, sorry, just if I could jump in, because I want to have my voice back. Um, if you were going to prospectively do this, I think it should be done in a consistent way. 
the men announced as I was referring to was looking backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a oath. If we're going to be doing this prospectively, it should definitely be done consistently. We should decide up front how, how, we, how we want to do it. If we want to ask different questions, that's fine. I think we can only be as consistent as the variables we know about. But there may be variables that we don't know about and that we're going to have to just overlook potentially. Um, you know, when, 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 one, when, when a sponsor plans a trial, uh, how much thought is, goes into the, I don't know, timing of the plasma collection on day X or day Y, the tube type, and how much uh, opportunity is there to create consistency based on some enthusiastic consortium recommending it be done like X or Y? Um, so, I mean, when we do it, it's mostly, you know, going to the collection of biological materials, except the PK sampling that typically occurs uh, um, with imaging, right? I mean, obviously, you're coming in at other cycles, so you could do it, but um, typically we try to keep um, sample collection to a minimum for the purpose of, you know, keeping the patient um, as happy as possible, as comfortable as possible. Um, so people don't like being stuck like mice you know, every, every couple of weeks. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, for us, it's, you know, six weeks or eight weeks, every six weeks or eight weeks, depending on the trial. Um, I think in, if the intent is to, to collect something for uh, regulatory evaluation, it certainly could be done. Um, but uh, ideally, we would have some data to, to, to support it. Um, we have done it in the past, but uh, certainly it's not across all trials that we, we do, you know, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. Because every, go ahead. So, we had the pleasure to visit Dr. Pasteur and we discussed in a very informal manner this. And after that visit, I implemented in every single phase one and phase two trial across Medimune on antibody drop conjugates and IOS cdDNA in a very consistent manner. Same platform, same, same days, same volumes. And because his answer was very clear, he give me data sets across different mechanisms of action. So I have ADCs, IOS, different tumor types, so we have indeed trials going on on certain solid tumor types, not long, uh, ovarian, others, uh, and across different stages. So that was harder, right? because we mostly do metastatic. However, we do have also the Pacific phase three trial, where we are currently looking at that. And, and I think all comes where, what's the vision and what's the level of commitment? And we have here Antoine Iver, who is in the in, in, in room too. I wonder, a company like uh, the one of Antoine, who has this antibody drug conjugate that is pretty amazing, are they looking at cDNA changes, correct? Because at the end of the day, is you need many stakeholders to be doing the same analysis across different diseases, across different therapeutic interventions to get to the relevant result. All right, the question has been put out. Dr. Burr, are you collecting circulating tumor DNA and are you collecting it according to the SORIA method? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how much variability there might be between methods used. We're collecting, but not as systematic. And so we have to look at the SOPs, right? But they, I bet there might be more consistency than we think in, in the methods being used. It might help if you published. The sorry method. And everyone, we are publishing. We are writing a white paper with friends who answer. We are on track. Take note for all to emulate. Um, and, the, and and again, you know, establishing such a, a standard is not necessarily a. You don't even need to be in a consortium to do that. You can just adopt a method that allows specimens and data to be potentially pooled at some point down the line to address a question. So we just need to make sure our method is, is, uh, is rigorous. We'll, we'll share notes afterwards. All right, so uh, I'm going to open it up for questions, I think, at this point, because we've gotten through a lot of our agenda. Though I'm a little, no, I'm not ready yet. Hold on, Dan is telling me not quite yet. Oh, I have to go to the rest of the table. Excuse me. Okay, so um, I think I can maybe I'll do this from my seat. So this is the table we had described as a consistent method that could be used uh, if you wanted to try to get on the same page as Dr. Soria and others in, in collection. I think some nuances, I do think collection of plasma early during a first COX check is meaningful. Most of the DNA, the DNA has a half-life of like a couple hours. 
So it all turns over within, like within a couple days, you can start to see dramatic change. It's not like a protein marker where it takes weeks <coughs> for a change to happen. So by two weeks, uh, and the work we've done with AstraZeneca, you have complete clearance of all the circulating tumor DNA from a patient treated with a drug like osimertinib. So if there is value, first off, to collecting a plasma specimen in two or three weeks during that first tox check when the patients usually come in to see how they're doing and get it set up, okay? Um, it's also, one of their nuance here is it don't just collect a screening sample and then they start two weeks later or a week later because in the time between your screening specimen and when they start, there can be changes. So you want your baseline to be the day that they start. That's a duplicate specimen, but it does create a more rigorous and reproducible baseline and allows for changes. Um, you know, one tube is adequate. A second tube would be great. But you're right, a second tube is extra pain, as in blood for the patient. So is it worth getting a second tube just for the sake of future regulatory interests? Maybe or maybe not. Um, but if you have the ability to get a second tube, uh, generally, you know, cheap to collect and, and can be, uh, be useful. One other nuance is the cell pellet. We've been throwing out the white cells for years, but the white cells are filled with DNA, white cell mutations that shed into the plasma. And all that white cell DNA actually, in retrospect, can be very useful. So if you're able to, save the white cell pellet, at least from one of these specimens, and that will create, uh, it can allow you to find out the white cells, the chip mutations, you can then delete out from the plasma signal. Um, tube type, I think, uh, Rena, you alluded to this, EDTA, STREC, kind of either one, if you can handle it, EDTA, if you want to spend the extra money, STREC, is that about right? I think it's about right. You that is about right, yes, but then prospective collections uh, that are used for regulatory submissions, you probably want to form uniformity. You get to uniformity as much as you can. True. I mean, I think EDTA is much more cost effective. If you're doing a multi-centered study, and they're going to mess with the specimens, you know, STREC is better. Um, and certainly if you're developing a diagnostic, you got to pick. You can't have it both ways. We're not developing a diagnostic here, right? We're developing a tool to assist drug development, so I think there may be more flexibility. Um, but you've used one, too, right? Maybe either need to or <laughs> But for a given trial, we use one, too, right. Uh, exactly. Well said. Uh, for, for, for NCI trials, we use EDTA. Okay. Yeah, we're on a budget here. Okay. But for <laughs> that's not actually totally true. They, they do a great job with Strat too. Um, so uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The truth is, and the, the final point here, we aren't sure how to measure change quite yet. Is that gets to the bottom here? But I think we're going to work that out by studying existing data, and we can figure out how to quantify this going forward. Um, I'm going to go to the next couple tables, which is uh, if we were to do a pilot. You know, I think there is interest in the new checkpoint inhibitors particularly here. That's a space where we would love for this technology to facilitate drug development. So if we could uh, learn from existing data and then pilot that across a bunch of I.O. trials, that would be very powerful. Though I don't think it needs to limit any, you know, ADC is a great idea. Any early stage trials, collect, and it will be useful, I think. Um, you know, limited detection, assays generally should be able to detect around 0.2%, 0.5%. We're not going to make them all be as, as sensitive as beaming necessarily, uh, but they should be uh, you know, sensitive enough to be, to be able to play the big leagues uh, with other leading assays. Um, and then other points here, I think, emulate the prior, which is we should all get on the same page. It's worth noting that for mutations versus insertions versus deletions versus amplifications versus fusions, there's actually yeah, enormous variability in how you quantify these things. And it's much easier to quantify the mutations. It's much more difficult to quantify complex variants. And so we will have to address that. You should be able to capture all these ideally, but they each may behave in their own way. Um, and then a final table about the, the data repository. I mean, a lot of these are just questions. Where are we going to put all this? Um, but I think we're starting to work that out. Certainly figuring out the wording of a contract, the fine print of, of, of agreeing to this is something that needs to be sorted out uh, in a pre-competitive way where all can learn from it. Um, you know, there are many questions out there, but I think they're addressable questions given this data is sitting there and patients would want it to be used, it would seem. Um, so, uh, here are some proposed next steps to develop a consortium across academics, diagnostics, government, pharmaceutical, patient advocates, and towards creating a, a data set to collect the, this plasma and or plasma uh, details. It doesn't have to collect the plasma, right? Just collect the data from the plasma analysis. It's fairly cheap to collect data. Uh, and then towards create some consistency on how we collect plasma going forward to, to maximize the opportunities. And with that, Dan, now can I turn it to questions? I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience.